Support for Knowledge Stream comes in part from a generous contribution provided by an anonymous donor. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd also like to extend our thanks to the program for having us, for this awesome university for uh, bringing me back. And I used to be sitting third row right there for all these sessions um, and also an undergrad. So it's really cool to be back here and to be on the other side of it. It's a little scarier when you have 100 set of eyes looking at you. But it's all good. <laughs> um, so again, thank you so much for you guys for having us here. Um, thank you guys for attending. And we're very excited to talk to you about this. So like you heard him say, we have surgery and neuropsych. And what on earth do these two have anything to do with each other? Uh, Manish and I bonded over our love of food. So we thought we'd present to you guys some little things that we learned throughout med school. Uh, some of it might be common knowledge, but we're going to expand on them a little bit. So well, the title, Fork to Fauna, we're going to unlock some secrets of nutrition and give you guys some hints and stuff that you can try out to optimize your health. So here's you on the inside. If you didn't know, you have a bunch of organs hanging out. Your GI system is the bulk of your body. You are here to eat and get rid of it, and that's how you're going to thrive. Today we're going to be talking about four secrets. Not so much secrets, but just main topics. We're going to be unlocking them as we go through our presentation. For our first one, I had a lot of fun with the graphics, guys. That's <laughs> Our first topic is going to be flavor, so from the fork, from that moment that you're thinking about food and you're trying to get your food. Usually when you think about food, the first thing that comes to mind is taste, the taste of it. We love it. We crave it all the time. But actually, food and flavor incorporates all your senses, all the main senses that you have. So let's say it's Friday night. You're hanging out in your apartment. Your roommate Joe is like, hey, let's get a pizza. From that first trigger of someone even bringing up the topic of food, your brain's already craving it. Your brain's thinking, yes, we need pizza. Let's do it. So the sound triggers that craving for you. You go into the smell. You drive to the place. You pick up your pizza. It's sitting next to you. Joe's kind of cheap. He didn't want to do delivery, so he had to go pick it up. So you're sitting in your car, and that maddening drive home, and the smell is just overwhelming. That, too, is priming your body. You're starting to salivate. You're starting to crave this food even more, priming your body for this upcoming feast that's going to happen. The sight that Instagram-worthy bo box opening. You got the boomerang, right? Uh, <laughs> so the sight of food, of course, it's one of our most important senses, being able to see what's around us. Um, it tells us that, yes, this food is good to eat. It makes us crave it even more and, again, prepares you for what's going to come next. Touch. Now, this one's maybe a less known one, and I'll get more into it in a little bit. Um, the touch sensation of food and how that affects everything as well. So that gooey cheese, the warm pepperoni, it's all playing into it. And of course, taste, that first mouth-watering bite, and that triggers everything to start. All these together is what makes up flavor. So the flavor of something is going to be all your senses incorporated, all the chemistries that go into it. So we're going to break these down a little bit. There's your pizza. <laughs> so what is taste? I know I said in this one we have these five sensations. We're going to focus more on the smell and touch aspects. The sound and uh, sight are what's going to trigger your cravings, but we're going to focus in on the other two in this presentation. So taste, like we said, made, or, uh, involves all the other uh, sensations as well. Smell and touch have a huge part in uh, what makes the flavor of something. It kind of used to be the thought that your tongue has these regions that can sense different tastes. So you have sweet in the front, sour on the side, salt kind of in the front as well, bitter in the back. This is the old way of thinking with uh, medical research and uh, furthering our knowledge with that. We now know a little bit more about what taste buds are, what they can sense, where they're sensing it, et cetera. So what it actually breaks down into is you have three main types of taste buds. You have the circumvallate in the back. They're kind of like the bigger ones, kind of sit along the ridge in the back there. You have the foliate along the edges of your tongue and the fungiform in the front. This is kind of where they tend to cluster. Um, you can find them anywhere, but this is their main regions. And instead of each region having one taste that it's responsible for, all five major tastes, salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami, they can be taste all over the tongue. Circumvallate in the back, yes, bitter is the most, you know, the one that senses the most back there. So it makes sense that we used to think that the back of the tongue was for bitter. But it actually can pick up other things as well. Foliate around the edges, some of the bitters, some of the sours, kind of goes along with the old way of thinking, but it actually can sense everything else. Fungiform in the front has that umami and the salty. And if you think about this a little bit, it kind of makes sense of why the tongue has these regions the way it does. You want your salty and the umami 
kind of up there in the front. Those are like the really yummy stuff, the chips, the, the hearty steak. You want your tongue to be able to see that first and be like, yes, this is an awesome meal, let's do this. Your sours and bitters kind of on the side and in the back so that when you start to swallow something that may have gotten rotten, you're going to taste that and your body's going to say, no, 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 get that out. So it makes sense that this is kind of how our tongues are uh, organized. There is a fourth type of bud called the filiform, and it doesn't have a taste sensation. We're, we're going to get to that one in a little bit. But just remember that it's there, and remember that it's kind of scattered all throughout the tongue. It doesn't have its own main region. If you zoom in on these taste buds, you have, see if I can figure this out. This is like hyper zoomed in and obviously cartoon. At the very top, you'll have your taste receptors, little finger-like projections that are going to pick up on any little chemicals, food that touches it. They all make up one taste bud altogether. They're going to send their sensations down, do some funky chemical ATP stuff there, and you'll see what will happen next. So I'm going to break down a little bit of like what the tastes are and what they mean. Umami is actually one of the newer, not new, we've always had it, but one of the ones that was more, more recently uh, studied and classified as its own taste. Uh, umami is, I forget what language. Japanese. Japanese, there we go. It's Japanese. Um, and it means like meaty and savory. Um, as we look more into this receptor, you know, there's pretty much one chemical, one amino acid, glutamate, that fits perfectly with the receptors for umami. The structure of glutamate, I don't know, just fits perfectly with it, and that's what's going to trigger that, uh, that I don't know, savoriness of the food. Um, what's really cool, for example, when you have ham, if you're going to cure your meats, the process of curing, it's going to be wrapped up, you're going to let it sit for a while. That process allows all the proteins in the meat to break down into their amino acids, and it allows the concentration of glutamate to increase. So the reason cured meats taste that much better, that increase of the glutamate after you eat it, or after you cure it, it's going to trigger more of the receptors, and it's going to trigger them even more strongly. So that's umami, one of my favorites, and I think it's uh, a lot of our, uh, a lot of people's favorites as well. Bitter and sour. I'm going to go with those two together. Uh, these ones are evolutionarily probably the most important ones. Um, as much as we love eating good food, it's more important for our bodies biologically and just survival to know when to not eat something, to know when something is potentially going to kill you. Uh, so bitter, for example, there's 10 times more bitter receptors in all these taste buds than there are any of the other ones. We are primed to tell if something is bitter or if something is sour because that's our body's way of warning us that this might not be good for you. Um, especially for sour, in, plant, or in plants, in fruit, uh, before they ripen, they are more acidic. And it's that acidity that's going to trigger the sour receptors. Um, as they ripen, as they become more sweet, and as they're ready to have you eat them and spread the seeds for them, that's when they increase their sugar content. I need to not play with that. Increase their sugar content. Um, this is kind of like a cool way that plants and humans have co-evolved. We have a receptor to tell us, no, this fruit's not ready to eat. And we have other receptors that tell us, yes, it's time to eat it. And the plant gets the advantage as well because all it wants to do is spread its seeds all over. Sweet, my favorite, of course. Um, we don't have as many sweet receptors as one would like. If you look at our society now, everything is sugar and donuts and all that good stuff. But we, they're very sensitive receptors. We don't have as many, but they're very sensitive to what they do. And as, as I was saying with the fruit, the nature around us has learned how to manipulate our taste buds to let us know when something is good to eat and good to spread the seeds for it. And salty. Now, salty is a really cool one. If you think evolutionarily, way back when, when we were living in the oceans, oceans are mostly salt. From our very basis, we are primed to need salt, live in salt, and crave it. Salt uh, receptors also have really cool effects on all the other tastes. So for example, salt and bitter, the uh, chemicals that they activate the salt, all those ions are actually going to block the bitter receptors. So Manish will be telling you in a little bit some tricks that you can do with that cool association. Uh, so salt blocks bitter. Salt also neutralizes acids. So the acids that are triggering your sour receptors, add a little bit of salt, neutralizes those. That's your lime tequila shot, a little bit of salt in there. Uh, and that's going to modulate that. So salt has this really cool effect on everything. And with sweet, it has a very unique effect where when, they, when both salt and sweet are triggered at the same time, it just has its own neuronal pathway to the brain. So all these have their own neurons. They have their own links to the brain. But salty and sweet have a unique pathway that runs together. So when they're both triggered, you'll have a different taste sensation. So there's your brain. 
scooped out a little bit because the area that we want to tell you about is kind of hidden a little bit. The three main nerves for senses or for taste in your, in your tongue, you have the facial nerve, and it's going to pick up all the taste from the front two thirds of your tongue. Your glossopharyngeal nerve in the back one third, and then your vagus nerve, which has a million other jobs, but it also does the taste sensation in the back of the mouth. So not only do you have the taste receptors on your tongue, but they kind of scatter all over as well. Did you guys like my little, there's my little neuron, my nerve running back up there. <laughs> and they're going to go to what's called the gustatory cortex, so gustation, eating. It's, part, or it's two parts to the gustation, gustatory cortex. Um, the anterior insula, which is that little hidden part, and then the frontal operculum. So that's part of the frontal lobe. These regions together are what get the information and understand that, yes, this is a taste. Now we have this little guy off to the left, which is touch. This is something that not many people know, that your tongue not only has taste buds, it has touch buds. And it goes back to the green uh, tongue area that I brought up before. So now I'll talk a little bit more about the touch part of taste. There's several different aspects of touch, uh, just kind of like the mouth feel of food. But the ones I'm going to focus in on are uh, the texture and viscosity and chemisthesis. So viscosity is kind of how smooth something is. If you think of emulsions when you have little drops of fat suspended in a liquid, your tongue loves that. The more viscous something is, the smoother it's going to spread across the tongue. And you have these touch buds all over the tongue. The more of them are activated at once, the better and the smoother something feels. And our bodies are primed to really like that. We get that because when we're born, we enjoy breast milk. And breast milk has that perfect viscosity that we're just primed to love. Chemisthesis is what it, how do I describe it? It's when a temperature tricks your brain into thinking that it's a flavor. So the main ones that you, the main ones that you see this with are cool foods and spicy foods. Uh, with spicy foods, the chemical that creates spiciness is capsaicin. It activates the TRPV1 uh, receptor, which is found in the tongue. So with that, when, it's, when this receptor is activated, your body literally thinks that your mouth is on fire. It's a, it's a touch receptor. It's like having your skin burn. It's going to be the same thing. What's really cool is what happens later on, where your brain takes that and changes it into a flavor. Kind of the same with cool foods, so like menthol, peppermint, camphor. They're going to activate the TRUMP8. I guess is how it's pronounced, uh, receptor. So it kind of does the same thing, where this is a chemical s reaction, a chemical trigger that your body understands as a flavor. So again, those filiform touch buds, the green ones that we had before, all over the tongue, and they travel through the trigeminal nerve. And what's cool about this is not only do they go to that gustatory cortex, like the uh, taste receptors, they also trigger the somatosensory cortex. The somatosensory cortex is what gets all your sensation information from all over your body. So if you were to burn your hand, that would light up. But when you're eating, and you're eating a, what's a spicy food? Balance, and you get like the extra hot stuff in it, uh, it's going to trigger both of these at the same time. And the fact that they're both going off at the same time, your brain is going to interpret that as this is one thing. These signals from the gustatory cortex and the somatosensory cortex all link to the orbitofrontal cortex like that. So with that, at the orbitofrontal cortex is where all this sensory information is getting integrated and put into one big picture. So it's at this place that your body takes this sensation of heat, the information of flavor, and it's going to put it together and say, oh yeah, I like this. I crave this, and this is pretty cool. In this area as well is the stimulus and reward association. You enjoy food. You got the reward of enjoying it. You got the reward of not dying that day because you ate, which is nice. <laughs> and it's going to reinforce behavior. It's going to tell your body, this is really cool. Let's keep doing this. I don't want to die yet. And then smell. So you have what's called orthonasal olfaction and retronasal olfaction. You probably know this from wine tasting. So you have the orthonasal when you're smelling something in. It's that breathing in of the smell. Then you have your retronasal. As you sip your wine, anyone under 21 here, you know, whatever. 21 and over, sip your wine, the flavor as it goes in the back of your tongue, if you actually exhale as you're having your drink, it's going to send all these smell uh, hydrocarbons up to this area as well from the back of your throat. So let's explore that just a little bit more. So you're going to start out with your you know, hydrocarbon chains, your aromatic molecules, thousands and thousands of these. They each have unique chemistries, unique side chains, unique R groups. Chilarity, what else? Chemical 
things. I, I haven't had chemistry since probably in this classroom <laughs> eight years ago. Um, and this is what's going to come in through the front. So orthonasal olfaction, you're smelling this in. And what's really cool is that some of these uh, chemicals interact with each other before you're even smelling them. And they can hyper attenuate each other, they can tone down each other, and you're not even doing anything with it yet. And a lot of restaurants will use this to their advantage and manipulate food to get you to like it even more. They're going to go to the smell receptors in the cribriform plate right at the top of your nose. These are bipolar neurons, so they're going to have a receptor at the end kind of feeling out for these, uh, these chemicals. And they're going to link to the olfactory bulb, kind of that larger clump right there. What's really cool about smell is that it's the only sensation that has this unique first stop, the olfactory bulb. Most other sensations, they're going to go straight to the brain, and your brain's going to take care of everything. But for scent, we have a separate processing network that will first make kind of this 2D map of the smells that you gave it. It's going to consolidate information into a nice 2D map. Bonus points to anyone that can tell me where this is from. Come up to me later. And this information goes to the, uh, the smell cortex in the brain. So kind of having that unique first stop, then going there. In the olfactory cortex, it's going to take this information from the olfactory bulb and integrate it into like a more of a 3D model. What's really cool is that we have consolidation of neurons, so the information coming from the bulb, maybe let's say 100 signals, get consolidated into one. And it kind of seems like it might blur the map a little bit, but your brain is really good at creating a unique scent, receptor, or scent profile from what the information is getting. And again, it's going to link to that orbital frontal cortex. So why is there this difference between orthonasal and the retronasal olfaction? Why is retronasal that much better? With orthonasal, just from the front, the information is going to go to the olfactory cortex, the red area, and that's kind of it. Like you have this one input coming in, your brain's like, all right, cool, this smells good, I like it, let's save that for later. With retronasal olfaction, you have not just the smell of it from the front, you got the smell from the back. You've got the information about the, the, the taste, the, uh, the feel of it, everything as well, all of it coming together in the orbital frontal cortex. So the fact that it's getting all these separate signals and able to consolidate it into one, makes the taste that much better. So this is a cool thing that like, our brains are naturally wired to do. As human beings, because we're bipedal and we're upright, in the way that our throats are shaped, we are primed to do retronasal olfaction even if we didn't know it. It's easier for, you know, in, comparing it to a dog, for example, like it's easier for us to have the uh, retronasal pathway. All right, done enough talking. It's all you know. <laughs> so cool, so some kind of tips and tricks that we can use to sort of uh, put a practical application to what we were just talking about. So a lot of foods you actually really can tell um, their true flavor based off of retronasal olfaction for a couple of reasons. One, the more advanced pathway that we were just talking about that's fully integrative. And two, um, there's actually compounds in your mouth as soon as you start digesting that break down some of those flavors. The best way to describe this is if you've ever had herbs and you've smelt them before you cut them and then you've muddled them if you're you know, making something or you cut them, they immediately start to actually burst out in flavor. The same thing happens in your mouth if you're given uh, you know, a pizza with a full leaf of basil on it. As soon as you bite into it, you're going to get a lot more of that flavor. So one of the things that we would challenge you to do is to say, for example, a famous experiment with this is uh, cheese. So a lot of different types of cheese actually get their flavor from when you breathe out. So if you were to plug your nose and take a bite of cheese, uh, two different types, you may or may not be able to discern the difference between them. And this is actually most famously done with a very stinky French cheese where somebody, where they were given two different tastes of mild cheddar and a very, very, very pungent French cheese. And uh, individuals weren't able to discern the difference between them until they released a paperclip from their, uh, their clothespin from their nose. Um, at which point, you know, half of them had a rude awakening, so to speak. <laughs> uh, the other thing that you can do is this also really applies to certain textures, so like fruit. Um, individuals, when given certain fruits that are comparable in texture, certain types of ripe strawberries and berries, et cetera, stuff like that, um, you know, if you completely uh, take a clothespin to the nose again and you were to just use your mouthfeel to try to understand that, you really wouldn't be able to discern the difference between the berries, so to speak, unless you're really acclimated to one's texture. Um, so that's just another way you can kind of try to test it out for yourself at home. The other thing is, uh, so moving on to point two with spicy food, uh, if you find that you really just can't tolerate it, as we were just mentioning, certain other taste receptors uh, will attenuate certain other signals. So if you it really can't tolerate spicy food, try throwing some dairy on top of it, and that will kind of help out. It's kind of like this, um, 
you know, if you eat something really spicy, they say don't drink water afterwards because that will just help the uh, oil compounds stay in an emulsion in your mouth, whereas if you drink dairy, it will completely neutralize them. So going back to what we were just saying, approaching new foods with all of your senses, if there's a certain type of food that you don't like, specifically because of smell or something like that, I challenge you to say, for example, uh, try it with you know, your nose plug, try, eat it, breathe out, see if maybe it's just the initial smell that you don't like. Um, you know, I know some people this is uh, applicable with seafoods or other types of uh, foreign cuisines. Oysters, I can't yeah. think. <laughs> but I will work on approaching it with all my senses. Exactly. So there's also some other things you can do. So say, for example, combining sweet and salty. So you can reduce the overall uh, sugar load that you would apply to a meal by adding a little bit of salt. Uh, this can also be done on ripe fruits uh, to really make the flavors pop as well. Um, and then sort of relating it to pathophysiology, um, because that's our, our nature, uh, specifically with disease and aging. So as you age and as you get certain diseases such as Parkinson's disease and even sometimes with MS, um, orthonasal, the initial smell, will start to deteriorate. You won't be able to smell foods as well. Uh, and um, so that can kind of, if you tell people about that and make them aware of the fact that they don't lose all of their smell, they really just lose the beginning portion of it, making people aware of it allows them to sort of enjoy their food more because they may be more cognizant of that sort of uh, second burst of smell. Another really cool thing is if you're sick and you're congested, uh, it's really your orthonasal pathway that's going to be blocked. You have all that congestion in the front of your nose, but you can still tune into your retronasal olfaction even when you have really bad congestion. So when you have like that chicken noodle soup, not only is it good for you for the nutrients and the flavor, or the, uh, the fluids, but the flavor as well, if you try to exhale as you're having it, you're going to be able to taste it a little bit more and hopefully it won't be as miserable. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here's more graphics, guys. I had so much fun with this. So we have unlocked our first secret. And for all these, there's so much more that goes into it. So we're really just kind of touching on the surface here. Um, all right. So our next topic, hunger and cravings. So as I was telling you, your roommate Joe brought up the pizza, and it sent you into this maddening drive to go get your food. So let's talk about what is the biological basis of hunger versus cravings. Now these are two separate topics. Hunger is going to be more of the body and the brain through feedback loops, through biochemistry. It's a very science-y approach. So let's kind of, let's, let's run through this. If uh, anyone wants to take notes, go for it. So at your baseline, you have glucose, sugar, that runs through your blood. Your pancreas, this little green organ hanging out behind here, produces insulin. You guys probably already know this. Uh, insulin is what's going to be the key to the lock. It's going to let your cells access the glucose that's floating in the bloodstream. Uh, people with diabetes that have insulin resistance or don't make insulin need to take it as a supplement on top of it to let their cells access the glucose. Glucose is what's going to give your cells energy. In the liver, we have glycogen. It's the storage form of glucose. Very long process that it goes through to become glycogen, uh, but it's kind of where we house all this reserve energy should we need it. So let's say you've had your breakfast and it's a few hours in, it's not quite lunchtime, but your glucose levels are starting to dip. You don't really notice it though yet, you're not super hungry. The reason, because of, the reason of this, as your glucose starts to drop, your pancreas again is going to create glucagon, another enzyme. Glucagon travels to the liver, and it activates glycogen to break down back into glucose and go back to the bloodstream. So this is kind of a very nice baseline pathway that's happening. You're not really aware of it. It kind of prevents you from being hungry all the time, which is really nice because if you look at some other plants and animals in our kingdom, their entire life is always acquiring food, always acquiring food. They don't necessarily have as good of these storage reservoirs that we do. So it's really nice for us that you know, we can do stuff in between breakfast and lunch as much as we don't want to breakfast and lunch. You don't always need a second breakfast, although it's nice. <laughs> so this is kind of like the baseline pathway. It keeps you going from meal to meal. But as it gets closer to lunchtime, or let's say you skip lunch and it's dinner time, your glucose level's way, way down. Not good. With that, you kind of run out of insulin. Your pancreas is going to stop making it. It's also going to stop making the glucagon. That whole pathway is not going to be as helpful. With this drop of insulin, it triggers the stomach to produce a hormone called ghrelin. The growling ghrelin is how we remember it. It's what makes your stomach growl. It's what kind of primes you to go get some food. So ghrelin in your stomach responds to the drop of insulin, which is responding to the drop of glucose. This sends signals to the hypothalamus, a little green area that lit up, to produce neuropeptide Y. 600 other chemicals go into it. Excuse me. 
But basically, this is what's going to increase your appetite. It's going to make you hungry. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm ruining the mic here. <laughs> um, so this is kind of like the basis for increasing your hunger at a biological basis. So you get your pizza, and it drops into your stomach, and you're super happy about it. With that, now your glucose levels are shooting up, which is really good. Your insulin's going to compensate as well and increase because you need that insulin to access the glucose. You don't really need that glucagon response anymore. You don't really need the ghrelin response anymore. So this is the, the negative feedback. As something goes up, something else is going to go down because you don't really need it as much. Therefore, the neuropeptide Y is going to also decrease. Now, what's really cool about this pathway, there's ghrelin in the stomach. But if you notice here uh, on your left thigh, you have some adipose tissue, fat. And it's not just in your thighs. It's all over. But in this picture, it's going to be in your thigh. This produces leptin. So your adipose tissue, it doesn't just sit there and you know, make your pants a little bit tighter. It's actually a very active organ in the body. It's producing hormones. It's feedbacking on other uh, uh, pathways. And it's, oh, it's beautiful. I love it. So leptin is going to increase once you're eating. And it's going to, again, trigger the hypothalamus to create POMC. 600 other things happen in between. But basically, this brings down your appetite. So it's this really beautiful, intricate system that's in a really good balance, all regulated by your hypothalamus and keeping everything in tune, which is nice. It's a really nice like, body and brain connection. What's sad, though, at least for me, is cravings, which is 100% in the mind, has really not much to do with these feedback mechanisms. It's this over, overarching thing that kind of drives us to get our food, even if we're not hungry sometimes, if we're just craving something. So there's a lot of uh, parts in the brain that are involved in the cravings pathways. Uh, the main ones I'm going to draw your attention to, hippocampus, where you have your memories of food that you've eaten before. You can't crave something that you've never eaten. I have never had octopus. I'm not really craving it. Maybe you've had it and you really like it, and you are. But unless you've actually tasted something and know what it is, and you have those memories of looking at it, smelling it, eating it, you're not going to want to crave it. So in the hippocampus, it's, it's the memory. It's the campus. It's where you learn everything. Um, it's where all these memories are stored, and your brain can access those if it wants to remind you, hey, we really like this food that one time, that six-layer chocolate cake. That was cool. Let's do that again. It's going to link to the amygdala, where you have these emotions, that happiness that that cake brought you. And this is what triggers the reward pathway. And this might be something that some of you know about, the mesolimbic pathway and dopamine. So dopamine is our main player in addiction. And you hear this a lot with addiction to alcohol and other drugs, uh, addiction to tobacco, et cetera. It's this pathway. And unfortunately, it is also triggered for food cravings and food addiction. Um, and that is a very real thing for some people, that you have actual food addictions, and this pathway becomes overstimulated, and it's, it's a difficult process to get out of it. Um, with the dopamine, it's made in the ventral tegmental area. This is like throwing me back to first year in med school. That was traumatizing. <laughs> uh, traveling to the nucleus accumbens, this is the main reward center of the brain. It motivates you to seek out things that have made you happy before. And it kind of drives your survival and goal-directed behavior. It's a very, very ancient part of our brains from back, way back when. This was like the core of our brains, that you were here to try to get your food, to acquire that, and that was your behavior. Now we can watch Netflix and do other fun things. But at some point, all we were trying to do is eat. Uh, and then all this travels to the prefrontal cortex. And this is where decisions are made, planning, impulse control. What's really cool about humans is we have the most developed prefrontal and frontal cortex, among other uh, animals. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that we're any good at it. So cravings are difficult. We're not going to tell you how to overcome every single craving. But there are some tricks that you can try. And with this knowledge, at least knowing that it's part of this dopamine pathway, it's part of addiction that also factors into other uh, aspects, it all kind of plays into it. So where did this come from? Like why? Why do we have cravings? Why do we like food? Why do we crave certain foods? If you look at most surveys, the things that people crave the most are chocolates, high fats, high calorie, high sugar type of foods. And that all really comes from the fact that from when we were even you know, fetuses in second trimester, we start to develop our taste and smell. And not only is the fetus starting to develop it, it's causing mom to also have an increased sense of smell, increased sense of taste. Um, that sometimes leads to food aversion, but it also leads to the well-known cravings during pregnancy. Like I was telling you, you know, way back when, when we were multicellular organisms living in oceans, we like salt. We are primed to live in salt. We can start sensing the saltiness in the amniotic fluid. So we start having that initial craving for potato chips, of course. 
This develops now into infancy. So like I was saying before, breast milk is that perfect combination that we just can't find anywhere else. It's high fat, high carb, and a really nice mixture. It's a very smooth, it's very high nutrients. It, it gets us to adulthood. It's, it's the thing that, or you know, childhood. It's the thing that, uh, <laughs> um, and so this is kind of also starting to start triggering those uh, reward pathways. So we know that breast milk is good, and nowadays we have really fancy infl uh, infant formulas as well that mimic it. So it's already starting to trigger our reward pathway. We already like salt, and now we really like fat and sugar. In childhood, we start to experiment with different flavors. Um, for any of you that have kids, you'll know that they go through phases where this is the best thing ever, I'll eat eggs every single day, and a few months later, they never want to touch one. This is normal. This is your own brain figuring out what do I like, why do I like it, where can I get more of it, where can I you know, throw it off the table and give it to the dog. And this is, this is all normal. So I, if you have kids, I encourage you to let them have this experimentation. You can't really force them to eat something that they're not going to enjoy. In childhood, you also start forming your fat tissue. And unfortunately, all the adipose cells, your fat cells that you create in childhood, will never go away. You can lose all the weight you want, but the cells will still exist. They'll just be smaller. So this is kind of an important time. Unfortunately, it's all about what your parents are giving you and what you, know, what you have at school, et cetera. So so much of it is out of your own control. And hopefully, you have parents that are in tune to it and can help you with that. In adolescence, the habit formation, the social influences in your frontal cortex is starting to develop. So you're starting to see advertisements. I, I really like this graphic because it had the girl on her phone. You're starting to see advertisements, and those are so huge in priming us to crave food. You know, you see that like Big, big Mac spinning on the screen, and <laughs> it's crazy. Just go through your normal day, see how many advertisements you see just for food, just for any types of food. And it all goes into adulthood. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase, you are what you eat, you are what you choose to eat. But really, there's so much more that plays into it. And it's not even just in our lifetime. This has been evolving for forever. <laughs> so back when we were early homo sapiens, we had very natural limits on food that we can get and where we can get it from. We had breast milk, which was really nice. It had that mixture of fat and sugar. But we couldn't find that anywhere else in nature because sugars came from fruit and your fats came from meats and there wasn't really a natural place that these were made or that these were blended. We developed into the hunky cavemen. Back at that time when we had the big hunts, you had big nutrient dense meals. You'd hunt down your mammoth and that was your big meal for a while. But then you had limited resources in between. So you had long periods of fasting and our bodies, because we spent so much time in this phase, really developed to kind of be in tune to that. Um, because we had such a hard time acquiring food sometimes, this is where our reward pathways and the food-seeking behaviors became very, very concentrated and very important to us. The amygdala at this point, this is like where all of it is developing. And we're starting to learn that if I put in all this work, all this energy into hunting an animal and preparing it, I'm going to have this awesome reward of a good, of a good meal. And you know, I can live a little bit longer and let my family live a little bit longer too. And then we developed into farming and industry. So as our frontal cortex continued to evolve, we got really good at organizing as a society, creating new foods, putting new things together. We started to have these creations of things that we didn't have before. So chocolate, for example, the fact that we realized you can take this very bitter cocoa bean and turn it into a beautifully mixed, you, know, you add some milk in there, you add some sugar, and it's amazing. We weren't able to do that a long, long time ago, but now we have it. And now because we have all this easy access to food and this good structure in place to get it, our meals shifted more into your eating a little bit throughout the day instead of the one big mammoth hunt and then you starve for a while. Unfortunately, now we're in the technological age where we have unlimited combos of fats and sugars and you can get deep fried Twinkies covered in bacon on a stick for $5. Like, you don't have to do any work. There's no longer that, you know, you don't have to put in the work to get your reward. The rewards are just there. So unfortunately, the society, which is really cool that we have this. I'm, I'm not complaining. I love me some deep fried Twinkies. But unfortunately, our bodies are not able to catch up. We still have those ancient pathways in place that trigger us to work hard for your food and then you're going to enjoy it. But if you no longer have to work hard and you're getting that reward all the time, your dopamine pathway is getting hacked and you're going to be addicted to food if in the worst case scenario of it. <laughs> I personally am partial to deep fried Oreos, but that's just me. Um, <clears throat> So some more ways that this kind of influences, or you are influenced by uh, what's right in front of you. So there's a uh, PhD over at Cornell who does a lot of really great work. His name's Brian Wansink. 
Um, he's the one who kind of, if you've ever seen an article, uh, you know, the proximity of the candy at your office desk determines how much you're going to eat based off of it. He does all those kinds of studies. So he did a lot of these ones we're about to talk about. Uh, first one's plate size and color. So this came out um, you know, about, I think about 10 years ago now, yeah, about 10 years ago now. Um, basically showing that contrast between the plate and the background of your table and the contrast between your food and your plate will determine whether or not you will over or under serve yourself. Um, this is based off of a uh, bias that we have called Del Beauf illusion. Basically, um, the best way to describe this is if you have two circles and in the inside you have a darker circle, if you make one circle very large, the other circle very small, we perceive the smaller one, the dark circle on the inside as being larger. The larger circle, we think of it as being smaller. It's the exact same thing with food. So if you're serving yourself on a massive plate, a like 16 inch diameter plate, you're gonna probably over-serve yourself because you want a reasonable size portion, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But if you have smaller plates, people will generally underserve themselves. And that's in the order of like 20 to 30% either way. Um, and this is also the same thing with the contrast between plate color and background color. So say, for example, if you wanna eat the rainbow, so to speak, you're more likely to eat less, which is why a lot of people, when they're advocating um, healthy eating diets, they'll say something similar. So if you eat multiple colors rather than eating a bland, uh, looking, say for example, macaroni and cheese on a yellow background, you're probably going to eat a lot more than if you ate green, red, purple, this, that, on a white background. You'll feel like you ate a lot more. Um, and so that's kind of what we're talking about with plates and portion sizes. Um, another thing that was kind of interesting that was done by uh, another uh, PhD, Dr. Uh, McFerrin, he did a really interesting study where he had about 90 college students go to restaurants and they were served by either somebody who was documented as being um, obese or what they call a confederate, or basically somebody who was documented as not being obese. Um, if you were served by an obese individual, you're more likely to be convinced to eat more, whether it's healthy or less healthy, and you are definitely more likely to have more unhealthy foods. Um, and that kind of worked the opposite way for the, the confederate or the non-obese person. So basically what this tries to tell you is that who is serving your food also determines how much you're willing to eat. Now, one of my favorite studies that Wansink did um, from Cornell was the bottomless bowls because this always happens with me when somebody is coming around and they keep refilling my bowl before I'm finished. I have no idea how much I ate. So he devised this really cool experiment where he had an entire dining table set up, uh, about uh, 16 people, and eight of them had normal, they would be served with a ladle, soups, etc. cetera. Um, the other side, the bowls would fill up from the bottom. So they would just literally have bottomless soup bowls, right? Which, you know, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, now, the key to what he found was not only did they eat like two to, like almost twice as much as the, uh, the control group, or so to speak, but they didn't feel any more full. Now, that's the key thing. They ate twice as much, but didn't feel any more full than the other group. So what does that tell you? Our, we tend to count calories with our eyes. Our mouth, our taste, our stomach, horrible determinants of how much we've actually eaten. Um, and he did a couple other studies to kind of talk about that too. But because we kind of count calories with our eyes, again, this goes back to plate size. Uh, you know, we may feel like eating one small bowl of chili, oh, we didn't really eat that much, even though it may be nutrient dense. We may still feel the same level of fullness with a minestrone soup versus that bowl of chili. And a lot of that just has to do with the way that our eyes process things. So another study that he did, um, <clears throat> had to do with the speed at which individuals eat and their distractibility of while they eat. So this is basically couch potato eating. This is exactly what he wanted to study. He wanted to say, if you're sitting down, and he did two studies where people were either talking, uh, you know, going out to lunch with your friends, or they were distracted, sitting down and watching TV. Um, in both times, individuals were way more likely to, to overeat. They just have zero sense of how much they've eaten, so they, didn't, uh, they weren't able to adequately accurately calculate the amount of food they ate, and they also underestimated the amount of calories that they consumed, and they didn't have any difference in fullness. That's another key thing. So again, when you're sitting down in front of the TV and you wonder where the whole bag of chips just went, you know, and you're wondering, oh, well, what time is it for dinner? That's the reason why. Um, also, eating quickly and until you're actually full, another study I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, so if you have some people, we always have one person in our group who we're all sitting down enjoying a conversation and within five minutes, plate's completely done. 
So if you eat until you're full and you eat very, very quickly prior to that, so to speak, 15 minutes for your body to acclimate, a lot of, it's kind of one of those common things people hear is wait 15 minutes after you eat to determine whether you want that second plate. Uh, that's for your brain to kind of kick in and say, okay, yeah, we may have had enough. But if you don't let your brain do that, you triple your risk of being overweight. So it's not to do with what you're eating necessarily, obviously that does matter, but it's also the way in which you're eating and the cues that we use to determine whether or not we've had enough. And a lot of that does go back to that addiction pathway that Sally was just talking about. Um, the last study that I kind of wanted to talk about was with thought suppression. So a lot of us, if we're trying to go on a diet, uh, we try to say, I don't want to think about food. I don't want to think about that cheesecake that's going to be presented to me at dinner. Well, a lot of studies have found that um, if you suppress thoughts of eating and you suppress your thoughts of food, you're far more likely to binge eat at the end of the night. So it's not, so, again, this is not to do with when people ate or how much they ate. It's just a thought of eating, the thought of having that meal in front of you or a big bag of chips, popcorn, whatever. You're way more likely to overeat when you finally do overeat, when you do finally eat, if you spent the entire day trying to avoid it. So there's really no avoiding the cravings that you may have. It's just a matter of, um, you know, manipulating them so that way you're not completely hungry throughout the day. Some people will say small portions throughout the day. Others will advise different things. Again, that's more based off of your personal self, but thought suppression doesn't necessarily work. We're not necessarily here to tell you how to live your life. That's not our jobs yet. <laughs> but we just want to give, bring, bring this up to your attention so that you have this knowledge and you can kind of try some of these tricks out if you're interested in doing so. So there we go, number two unlocked. Number three, digestion. And I'm sure at this point some of you have checked your watches, checked your phones, and it's already getting kind of late. But we're gonna spend nine hours talking about what's broken down by what, where does it go, what happens when it gets there. Your main digestive juices, your saliva from your mouth, the gastric acid in your stomach, pancreatic acids from the pancreas, and your bile from the gallbladder and liver. Macronutrients, your macros, your fats, proteins, and carbs, and your micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Any of you taking notes, get ready. Digestive juices, saliva, <laughs> gastric acid, pancreatic acids, and bile. Are you guys getting all this down, right? We just want to highlight to you guys how beautifully intricate and amazing all this is. We take eating for granted. We do it three, five, ten times a day. And we don't really think about what goes into it. Your body is doing millions of things all at once to not only create the enzymes to break down your food, but to also absorb and distribute your food and then use it later as needed. Your macronutrients, your fats, your proteins, your carbs. Go back, your carbs. So all of it, it's these amazing pathways. And if you really want to learn them, you know, you can come to med school, hang out with us, take a bunch of exams on it. It makes you really not like it after having exams. But <laughs> if you take a step back and just really appreciate how, how beautifully intricate it is and how cool it is that we live in a time where we can break this down and understand it and use it to our advantage. Even though society has kind of beat the brain and the body a little bit, we have these tricks that we can try and we have the knowledge to counteract that. And vitamins and minerals as well. It, it really just gets more complicated the more you go into it, but it's, it's so cool. So this one's kind of a tease. We're not actually gonna break down everything about these. We just wanted to draw your attention to like how cool and how intricate it is. Um, and kind of touch on a little bit about some of these maybe fad diets or fad things that are coming out. Digestive enzymes, multivitamins, et cetera. So let Manish tell you all about that. Uh, so this top line, amylase, protease, lipase, and lactose, those are the names of the actual enzymes that break down their respective uh, substituents, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and lactose. So digestive enzymes are sold and marketed to individuals who have typically pancreatic insufficiency. That would most likely be somebody who has like cystic fibrosis or something. Basically, their body is not able to produce the enzymes required to break down what they're taking in. So then they'll have issues with malnutrition. Um, also, another more common one is lactose intolerance. That's a lact the lack of lactase, tongue twister. Um, and so supplementing with lactose or lactate can really help the individual and those around them. Um, so another indication that some people are kind of saying would be post-cholecystectomy, which is removal of your gallbladder. Gallbladder typically produces bile, which contains a lot of these digestive enzymes. Um, there's not actually a lot of evidence to support that. That seems to be more of a marketing scheme, so to speak, because there's a lot of people who have had their gallbladder taken out. Um, so if you can market to them, uh, you know, you're gonna be able to sell your product. 
So the evidence basically says that the liver is able to produce enough bile so that way you're able to do, uh, you're able to digest um, items properly. If you're having symptoms of malnutrition, whether it's difference in uh, stool production, this, that, you know, whatever indication you have that your body is not digesting properly, then it's more consult your physician and see if you require it. But uh, it, it is one of those sort of fad diets where they'll sell amylase, protease, lipase, and lactase as a kind of compound and that you can take that. Some people are saying it's for weight loss. There's absolutely no evidence to support that uh, currently. Um, Another one of these digestive enzymes would be uh, marketed as Beano, which is alpha-D-galactosidase, which if you have a high fiber diet, so vegetarians and vegans who eat a lot of their uh, fiber from beans and a lot of vegetables, et cetera, they need uh, additional um, carbohydrate digestion, and that's done by alpha-galactosidase. So if you find that you can't do that, you can't digest, so you're having bloating as a result of having a high bean or high fiber diet, um, then you could supplement with that. But again, that's more of an as-needed basis, uh, so to speak. So that kind of covers some digestive enzymes. So multivitamins, there's been a lot of um, kind of interesting studies, uh, interesting studies on them. So one of the biggest things was in 2003, the USPTF said uh, there is no real conclusive evidence for um, USPTF is the United States Services Preventative Task Force. They give kind of the guidelines for saying there is evidence for this indication, there is not evidence for this. Um, they basically said that there's insufficient evidence to recommend against the use of vitamin A, C, E, folic acid. There's no necessary overall benefit to cardiovascular disease and cancer. There was two large study trials that were done in two, uh, the analysis was done in 2013 for cardiovascular disease and cancer specifically. It was done on about, the analysis included about 29,000 individuals. Um, so it's a pretty well, well powered study. Uh, basically saying that only in males and older males was there a minor benefit towards giving a multivitamin for cardiovascular disease and cancer, but not enough evidence to actually recommend the widespread use of it. Uh, so again, there's no real necessary indication. The one thing that they have found, though, is that supplementing with beta carotene, um, supplementing with beta carotene can increase by about the likelihood of 20% uh, incidences of lung cancer. Um, so they recommend against supplementing with beta carotene as itself. So with multivitamins, there's kind of a couple, um, a couple interesting things with them, and this kind of goes right back to those digestive enzymes and dietary supplements. Overall, it's actually the FDA's view on dietary supplements that makes this whole conversation a little bit difficult. And what I mean by view is that the FDA does evaluate claims of disease cure, uh, being able to cure a disease. Okay, if you say I can treat diabetes, the FDA will evaluate that product. However, if you say what's called um, structure or function claims, those are okay for dietary supplements. Those are not evaluated by the FDA. And what do I mean by structure or function? So say, for example, if you're talking about uh, BPH, benign prostatic, hyper, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, aka you can't pee if you're an older male, uh, difficulty urinating, you can say promotes normal urinary flow, relates to body physiology. Individuals will then say, oh, well, then I'm sure that must treat BPH, right? Because my issue is, is I can't pass urine. So I'm going to take a supplement that helps me increase my urine production. Or, say for example, if you have diabetes, it helps, normal, uh, it helps support normal blood glucose levels. That again does not directly say it's evaluating for diabetes, but in the layperson's eyes, that's a little difficult to discern because a lot of the medications will say, this will help you promote a normal blood sugar, this will help normal your A1C, et cetera. So they'll talk about the markers and say that helps. So this makes it very muddy when you're talking about the claims of, di of uh, supplement, dietary supplements, multivitamins, and again, these other sort of fad things like digestive enzymes, because they can make structure and function claims that are not evaluated by the FDA. So it's always very important, again, to, at the end of the day, consult your physician, let them know what you're taking and when, because the biggest studies that have been done on these sort of dietary supplements is actually their interaction with traditional medication. Um, and it is very important to understand the interaction and, and uh, some of them can kind of increase the amount of drug that's in your body. Some of them can decrease it and decrease, uh, in, interact with the way that the medications work. Um, I believe that's all I wanted to mention on that. Yeah. Yeah. So again, to emphasize that um, we're not here to tell you what to do. If something works for you, that's great. I mean, do it. 
be careful with it and let your physician know so that way they know if it's going to interact with any of your other medications and just to have that, that relationship with your doctor. Um, what's really cool about our medical education is now this is kind of an up-and-coming field. We're not just glossing over, oh, multivitamins, the end of story. We're actually being taught this is what they do, this is how they're marketed to the consumer, this is what your patients are going to come in asking you these sorts of questions. So it's really cool for us that we have this knowledge. And we're not here to tell you don't take something. We're here to see, yes, is it safe for you to take? Is it working for you? Some of it might be a placebo effect, but if that works, it works. Like you, I've shown you before, your mind does amazing things that your body doesn't even understand. So if something works, that's awesome. Talk to your doctor about it, get it cleared, and you're good. <laughs> So number three is not actually unlocked because we kind of glossed over through a lot of things. <laughs> but our last topic is the microbiome, the GI microbiome in you. So if you did not know, you are actually, if you're looking at the genome itself, if you're looking at DNA, you're made up of more bacterial DNA than human DNA. You're not a human being with bacteria inside of you. You are bacteria just hanging out in the human body. So let's <laughs> touch on like the main bacteria through the GI system. Bacteria is found all over your body, on your skin, in your mouth, et cetera. We're just going to focus on the main organs here. In the stomach, the main player, you have 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 uh, amount of bacteria. The main player is lactobacilli. The stomach's very acidic. It's very harsh. Not many things can thrive there. But lactobacilli is a tough little guy, and he can do it. You kind of get to like the early small intestine, the duodenum. Lactobacilli is still thriving a lot. And you have what's called helicobacter. If any of you have ever had a peptic ulcer, this is the main bacteria that thrives in peptic ulcers. You have them normally. It's, it's okay to have helicobacter in your body, but when they start to overpopulate, when you're, say for example, if you're not eating, or if you're eating too acidic of a diet and they're thriving, uh, that's when you start risking peptic ulcer disease. You get into like the late small intestine, you're starting to get further away from the stomach, there's less acidity, the numbers are going up, you're 10 to the 5 now. Lactobacilli, streptococci are the main players here, but there's so many more. There's, I think, 4,000 types of bacteria in your body, but 40 groups make up about 99% of it. At the ileocecum and the appendix, so right through here, right where your small intestines are ending and your large intestines are beginning. Traditionally, we kind of thought of the appendix as just this little, little guy that hangs out, gets inflamed every now and then, and it'll be my job to take it out. And kind of that was it. We, we didn't really know that, that there was a higher function to it. Now we're starting to understand that the appendix is actually a very important house for these normal uh, flora that lives in your gut. So, if you have your appendix taken out, I'm sorry, you know, you're done. But if you still have it, it's actually a very important immunomodulator. These bacteria have a much bigger role than we ever thought. And this is kind of like on the horizon in medical research. This is what's really coming out now. Uh, so starting to learn more about the appendix and learning more about this bacteria. So at this point, when you're starting to transition from your small intestine into your large intestine, the diversity of the bacteria increases, the functionality of them increases by a significant amount. You go from the seventh to the twelfth power. And here in the large colon, this is where your bacteria are. This is why your feces smells, and it's mostly bacteria. Uh, but this is where it's all happening. This is, this is you. It's your bacteria. You're not a human being. I'm, I'm sorry to shatter your reality like that. Um, and this is a, a very small list of what's available here. Some of these are actually pathogenic uh, bacteria. In some cases, they can cause systemic diseases, and that's not very good. But in small doses and different family types that live in the colon, these are normal to exist here. So where is this even coming from? From, again, in the uterus, your placenta is your first source of normal colonization of your colon. Uh, as you're being born, you get exposed in the vaginal canal as well. They did a study comparing C-section versus natural birth, and babies born via C-section do not have the same amount of diversity and number of bacteria in their colon. And it continues to develop by age two. Uh, by age two is when you have like a full house of bacteria. And that makes sense. That's when you're starting to experiment with different foods. Your body has had time to learn what your diet is like, and your bacteria are responding accordingly. And it modulates throughout your life based on the types of foods that you eat, based on where you live, based on your external environment. If you have some diseases where your immune system is modulated, it, it's, it varies person to person. But some of the biggest functions of these bacteria, uh, they're not just here to look pretty on a slide, they are helping you just exist. They are helping you break down fibers into short-chain fatty acids so that your body can absorb them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to tap into these resources. They produce vitamins, vitamin B, vitamin K. They help with the bile acid and sterile metabolism, letting your body recycle these, uh, these chemicals so that you don't have to keep making more and more of it. 
Uh, I mentioned before the immune modulation antibodies. The bacteria themselves, they're, they're living organisms. They're creating their own antibodies. They're challenging your body just a little bit and saying, hey, I'm here. What are you going to do about it? And that kind of triggers your body to create antibodies. It's, it's a nice system. You know, they're, not test they're not necessarily causing disease. They're naturally triggering your body to start uh, producing antibodies. Um, infection, so these bacteria can secrete propionate and acetate, and they directly battle the bad bacteria. So because you have all this healthy bacteria in your, in your body, it's combating the unhealthy bacteria. The big one you might hear of is C. diff, Clostridium difficile. Uh, it's the very, very bad diarrhea. You see it a lot in hospital settings. Um, what unfortunately happens in hospitals is we use a lot of anti antibiotics, and overuse of antibiotics clears out your GI system from all these healthy bacteria that you normally have. So with that, C. diff starts to grow. C. diff tends to be more resistant to antibodies that we have. So as you have this increase of the bad bacteria, your body's like, oh, I, I don't like this. No, 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 diarrhea. Uh, so you kind of need this healthy bacteria in place at a good level to balance everything out. So I know I said the gut microbiome and you, but really the gut microbiome is you. I really hope your brains are not that size because it's probably not healthy. <laughs> So uh, maybe not well known thing is yes, you have your massively large coming out of your head brain, but you also have an entirely separate nervous system in your gut, the enteric nervous system. It's an independent neural network. It has its own neurons. It has its own independent functioning without the central nervous system. It can function on reflexes. It does not need the brain to be involved. And it makes sense because if you look back when we were evolving, our main job was take in food, digest it, take it back out. So it makes sense that like, before we even advanced in any other fields in our bodies, our GI system was the most important, and it has this neural network. Uh, it can respond, respond to mechanical and chemical changes, so it knows if you ate a bad meal, it's going to have you vomit and, and you know, send it out the other way as well. And these, this is normal. You, know, you kind of need this in place. Um, it regulates peristalsis, which is like the normal movement of food throughout your GI system, uh, secretes its own enzymes. And what's really cool and not well known is dopamine and serotonin, which are very important in mental health and mood, most of it are housed in the GI system. It contains 50% of your total body dopamine and 90% of your total serotonin. And this is a really cool up and coming field in medicine as well, looking at that link between anxiety, mood disorders, and the enteric nervous system. And now this new thing on the horizon, the gut, or the microbiome gut brain access. So you have the vagus nerve, this little guy, which you know, kind of travels like that. Um, it's this main highway link between the, the gut and the brain. Again, I'm telling you, like, the enteric nervous system creates its own uh, enzymes, but the gut flora, all these bacteria in your system, are also creating enzymes. So dopamine, serotonin, histamine, they're able to modulate, they're able to change the environment that they're in, and your body's going to respond accordingly. Uh, and again, I was telling you, there's this now more studies looking into gut flora and anxiety disorders, mood disorders. What's really cool is now, most of it is animal studies. I'll let you know when they start doing the, the human trials. Um, but they're looking at mice. And if you completely clear out a, mice's, uh, mice's, a mouse's GI system, um, when, they, when they no longer have that col uh, colonic bacteria, their HPA access, their hypothalamus pituitary access, this part that I was telling you about before, that gets over-exaggerated. And they have a, higher, or a harder time responding to stress because they're pretty much responding from the brain and it's going to over-amplify their stress response. So when you give them bifidiobacteria, which is one of the main players in the gut flora, it reverses that. It actually calmed down these mice because they had this gut flora that was creating these enzymes as well, increasing serotonin, increasing dopamine, which all play into mood and stress. So really cool stuff. And I'm really hoping, you know, next 5, 10, 15 years, there'll be so much more research into this, and this can be something that we can talk to our patients about. I'm just going to run through the three main players the most found ones in the GI system. Uh, kind of in the upper system, you have the Prevotella. These are found in people that have, or they're found more commonly in people that have a high carb diet. And they play a role in the early fermentation of food up in like the stomach and small intestine, um, which is really cool. They're playing a really important part for us, helping us digest our carbs and starches. The downside of that is that they're linked to chronic inflammatory states. And it makes sense. The, the process of fermentation creates more radicals, creates more uh, inflammatory markers. Makes sense, so just kind of nice to know that. Um, my two favorites are Bacteriotes and Firmic Firmicutes, like the cuties, like the little clementines. Uh, so Bacteriotes have been found in the high protein and fat diets. This is what's really cool. These are more evolutionary linked to back when we were cavemen and we were eating that you know, big mammoth for a meal, had high protein, had high fat. 
This is when we're thinking that this type of bacteria started to thrive in our systems. They also thrive when we're fasting. So it makes sense that back then when we were going long periods in between our meals, this bacteria is really okay with that. They're totally cool with that. So now we see it in a normal day. If you look at someone that's been fasting or trying intermittent fasting or one of these uh, diets, they'll have a higher concentration of this bacteria. The contrast to that is Firmicutes, which are found in the more not high fat diet, but more frequent fat diet. So kind of the diets that we have now where we can eat pancakes for breakfast, burger for lunch, and pizza for dinner. We tend to have higher, val or higher amounts of this bacteria. And they thrive after meals, which again makes sense the type of food that we have nowadays where we're eating smaller meals throughout the day. And this plays a huge role in fat absorption and metabolism. So it's been studied uh, in mice again. The mice that have a higher concentration of Firmicutes tend to be more obese. And then bacteriodes kind of balances out with that. So it's really cool. Not only are they individually existing bacteria, but it's all part of one big picture. They all impact each other and they're impacting our bodies. So again, you're, you're a Petri dish. You're not even, you're not even human. <laughs> Where did my, I keep losing this. So again, talking about supplements. Um, one of the other large groups of supplements that have kind of come about the last couple of years, maybe five, 10 years, has been taking probiotics. Uh, a lot of people will say, you know, eat yogurt, it contains a lot of probiotics, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> some others just have general supplementation with them. So talking about what the evidence tells us about probiotic supplementation, a uh, couple areas where it seems to benefit. The largest um, area where it seems to help with is GI, as we were just talking about. So um, specifically, as Sally was mentioning, when you give a lot of antibiotics, uh, you kill off the normal gut microbiome, so you have very low numbers of everything. Uh, one of them, Clostridium difficile, C. diff, tends to overgrow, resulting in diarrhea. Um, so C. diff can really help, uh, sorry, lactobacillus can seriously help C. diff um, when you're giving that as sort of, uh, as a supplement. In addition, uh, talking about um, infantile diarrhea that's n more infectious related as well, uh, B. lasis and L. casei, uh, seem to help with stool consistency and regularity specifically. So say for example, studies have found that it increased like bowel movements by 1.3 times a week, increase, uh, decrease uh, stool consistency so that it's easier to pass for infants, preventing colic. Um, so it can really just help with infants who have antibiotic associated diarrhea and infectious associated diarrhea specifically are what the largest um, studies have done. Some of the studies are also saying that it can, it's equally as beneficial for adults specifically with C. diff or antibiotic associated diarrhea. Um, a lot of the studies right now, they're taking a look at Crohn's disease and IBD, uh, irritable bowel disease. So Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, a lot of studies are looking to see what sort of benefits they can have. Um, a lot of studies seem favorable, but not sort of sound enough for us to say that that's a, that's a true indication for it. Uh, whereas right now, what they would recommend is if you have a child who has diarrhea, they would say, you know, probiotics may be able to help them. Um, overall health, so with children, there was a couple studies uh, talking about upper respiratory tract infections, which I thought was pretty interesting. So 2016 published a review of 23 trials, including about uh, 6,300 uh, 6, children, newborn to 18-year-olds, basically found that um, these kids, when they were taking probiotics regularly, had a fewer number of respiratory tract infections in a year, um, and they also had fewer days absent uh, from school due to their upper respiratory tract infection. However, there was no significant decrease in the actual length that they were infected. So it's not, taking a probiotic is not necessarily going to reduce the number of days that you're sick, but it'll make you overall less sick in terms of upper respiratory tract infections for children, is at least what the uh, reviews are kind of telling us right now. So it's another important diet, another important connection between diet and overall well-being. It's not just your gut that's affected by this. So specifically talking about individuals with diseases such as uh, type 2 diabetes, on all of the indications or indices that we use, such as fasting blood glucose, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, um, the lipid profile, so that's your high density lipoprotein, HDL, LDL, basically all the measures of fats and diabetes that we use. Um, taking probiotics regularly in a, in a relatively small trial improved every indice. So basically it means a decrease uh, blood glucose, decrease LDL, which is the so-called bad cholesterol, um, decrease systolic and diastolic blood pressure in individuals who had a little bit higher blood pressure, and then also increased uh, HDL. 
Keeping in mind that the effect sizes or the overall amount that they increased and decreased was relatively small, it's just another indication that this is a possible venue that we should look at further. And that's what a lot of these studies kind of tell us when you're talking about probiotics is this is an ex incredibly exciting and possibly far-reaching avenue that really needs a lot more studies. Um, you want to do the... Yes, yes. of course. <laughs> uh, so at the American College of Surgeons conference this year in San Diego, one of the main speeches or presentations was about the microbiome and what can, it, what can we do about it um, as far as surgical site infection rates and then return of normal gut motility after surgery. And this is really cool, especially to me, because this is the field I want to go into. The fact that we can tie in our diet and modulate how we're going to heal after a surgery. Um, they were, again, looking at the types of antibiotics or... Uh, antibodies that uh, these bacteria are triggering your own body to create. So if you, for example, take probiotics before certain types of surgeries, you're going to heal a little bit faster afterwards because this, uh, this bacteria is going to trigger your own body to create IgA and help with infection. So just like really cool little things like that. Again, this is all kind of on the horizon, just now starting to dive into it. So much more uh, that's going to need to be researched, but you know, come back to us in like 10 years and we'll have so much more about this. Uh, it's going to be a really cool, really cool thing. And that's all we have for you guys. Thank you so much for attending. Support for Knowledge Stream comes in part from a generous contribution provided by an anonymous donor.